Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, welcome, everyone. I am going to do something that uh, I'm really looking forward to these two hours. I'm going to just tell stories. Um, I've been an activist on the GMO front for 26 years. And <clears throat> I'm going to just share some of my favorite stories that are quite revealing and some of them amazingly outrageous when you think about that, co that companies like Monsanto are getting away with it. I learned about GMOs in 1996. I went to a lecture by a, a, gen a genetic engineer who was kind of blowing the whistle. Um, he was talking about the fact that they were about to plant genetically engineered soy and corn in Iowa where I was living. And uh, I realized that the, he told us that the technology was not ready for prime time, that it was prone to, science, to mistakes. And he was a genetic engineer. He was working under grant from NIH. He was an award-winning scientist. And he knew absolutely for sure that no human being on earth had the ability to safely and predictably manipulate the DNA with expected outcomes. So he knew that companies like Monsanto were going to be gambling with our health and gambling with the ecosystem. Because with soy and corn, the outputs of soy and corn are in most processed foods, the derivatives. And the once you release the soy and corn into the environment, it will cross with relatives with, with non-GM corn. Uh, soy doesn't typically cross-pollinate, but there's some. But it could contaminate the gene pool forever. So when I learned about this, I realized this was a number one priority. And maybe I'll help out a little. So <clears throat> I wrote some lectures and consulted and had some fun with it. But then I got hired as the vice president of marketing at a GMO detection laboratory. And it was a neutral laboratory. It didn't take a position on GMOs, but its work was very important to help non-GMO products be produced because the biotech industry was trying to convince the world that you couldn't tell the difference. They even told Dan Glickman, the Secretary of Agriculture, who traveled through Europe trying to promote GMOs, he just mouthed what they said, that you can't tell the difference. But from a, using genetic tests like PCR, of course you could tell the difference. And when he found out, we heard, he was really angry at the biotech industry for lying to him so that he would lie to Europe. Well, this molecular biologist was aware that you could tell the difference and Europe didn't want GMOs. And the US was saying, well, you have to take it. There's no way you can tell. So he created the first laboratory to detect and quantify GMOs in US exports, <clears throat> which allowed soy and corn and then canola and other things to be sent to Europe or to be used in non-GMO declared products in the United States. They were also certifying products as non-GMO, kind of a precursor to the non-GMO project. So I worked there as the VP of Marketing Communications for a couple of years and was basically being paid to become an expert. I was reading all of the data um, that was coming in around the world on GMOs. And there was one interesting thing. Most of our clients, nearly all of them were companies, but at one point, we got contacted by a consortium of activists, <clears throat> and they were looking for Starlink corn in corn products sold on the shelves. The reason why they were looking for Starlink was because it wasn't approved for human consumption. There were some things in the Starlink that indicated it could probably be an allergen. And so in the infinite stupidity of the EPA, as if they have absolutely no concept of how things are produced, shipped, and stored in the United States, they approved the Starlink corn for animal consumption and not human consumption. Now think about it. You have some farmers growing corn in one field that's unapproved for human consumption. 
in the field next door, you have the human consumption corn, and it just takes wind blowing the pollen at the time that, it's, that the other corn is tasseling, and now you have contaminated the human food supply. But also, farmers were not really told ever that this was not approved for human consumption, so they would sell it into the big storage elevators, and they weren't told it wasn't approved for human consumption, and so it was a ticking time bomb. And this group, lend, let, this group of activists sent, I think, 23 samples to our lab for testing. So one day I get a call from the lab manager, and he said, we found it in craft taco shells. And I was like, this was intense news. So I said, don't tell the client, retest it. I'm going to meet with the, with the CEO and the, and the chief scientific officer. So we met with them. They tested it again two more times. They sent the PCR product for sequencing to make sure it was Starlink. And then we told them the results. They put it out a press release. It was a billion dollar problem. All of these foreign countries that import US corn, Europe, Japan, China, shut their markets down. Over 300 brands were subject to recall. I was interviewed by the New York Times and, and all these different places. It was, we were being called constantly. And then we were attacked. Now, they didn't attack the activists who sent us the brands, they attacked the laboratory claiming it's impossible so i was on the phone with Kraft and giving them the 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 lot number and we shared some of the tacos with another lab and they confirmed it so all of a sudden the attack simmered about four or five days later we learned our lesson we should have had another lab confirm it before we told the uh client but anyway it was uh, fun to be right there in the headlights in a global emergency that literally cost about a billion dollars and alerted the world that the U.S. could not keep GMO and non-GMO separate easily. And many times countries would even refuse to, to take any products from any country that was growing a GMO version of it. And there's been other contamination events since then. I was not part of the laboratory. What happened is before I went to the laboratory, I was thinking about writing a book, but then I put it on the shelf when I was working at the laboratory. And I was reading all of the press every day and there was no, almost no press in the United States. Um, everything was coming out of Europe. And one time there was an article in the international uh, version of Time magazine, and we were all excited because this was going to be the big first breaking story on GMOs because no one knew what a GMO was and we were eating it already. This was 99 and 2000. And when it finally was published in the United States, the American version didn't have the GMO story in it at all. So there was a tremendous amount of censorship and bias in the mainstream media, which has been later documented and verified. So I realized that I was motivated to get the word out in the United States. And I'm going to describe in a moment a story that happened in Europe <clears throat> that led to a European rejection of GMOs based on the information about the health dangers. So I decided to write the book Seeds of Deception, which is the subtitle is Exposing Industry and Government Lies About the Safety of the Genetically Engineered Foods You're Eating. Now, it was all about the safety. At the time, after I left the lab in 2000, no, no GMO organization was diving into the health dangers. They, they were focused primarily on the environmental problems, the farmer need to save their seeds and the concentration of wealth in the hands of a few companies and the, the fact that patenting life should be illegal. They had four or five sentences dedicated to health. 
No long-term studies have been done. We don't want to be used as guinea pigs. It could create allergens, toxins, or anti-nutrients and could lead to antibiotic-resistant disease. That was the extent of the global dialogue on the health dangers. It was as if the public relations efforts of Monsanto were successful in <clears throat> bullying anyone that talked about the health dangers, so no one wanted to go there. So I decided to go there. And I realized that since people didn't even know what a GMO was, the book could not be a dry scientific uh, book. It had to be a storybook. <laughs>